I'm Lori Sutton, and today I'm the face of America. My name is Lori Sutton. I'm privileged to serve uh, 30 years in the U.S. Army as a psychiatrist, now five years in the city here in New York, and now I'm running for mayor of New York City. I could not be more delighted to be with you and to serve as the face of America today. I was born in a little town in Southern California, Loma Linda, and what I like to tell folks here in New York City is, I wasn't born here, but after 30 years serving the country all over the world, I got here as soon as I could. My wife, Lori, and I, we've been here longer than any other place that I have lived in my entire adult life. My father did serve as a journalist in Korea. And one of my favorite photographs, we sent it out on Father's Day, has him there, you know, with his little pencil behind his ear and his, his typewriter and Corporal Art Sutton with a big sign behind and saying, this ain't the army. So I had some influences there, I'm sure. But the primary military influence for me growing up came through Corporal Desmond Doss, who you may have heard of Corporal Doss. He was an army medic, a conscientious objector, and a Medal of Honor recipient for his service in Okinawa during World War II. He was a family friend, and on Sunday dinners, we would sit around and ask Uncle Desmond to tell us about the war. And he was an amazing influence. He truly was. He was my first Army medical mentor. You know, I think a dedication to service stands out most of all for me. Uh, both of my parents uh, worked hard at work they loved doing, work that they thought really mattered. My mother was a member of the founding uh, an international heart team for Loma Linda University. Back in the early 60s, they deployed to places like Pakistan, to uh, Greece, to Saudi Arabia. And this was at the very beginning stages of open heart surgery. And they taught local healthcare professionals how to set up their own programs. I was so proud of her and her work, the work of the team was recognized by both Presidents Johnson as well as President Nixon. My father, he worked, he was very active um, in politics, both uh, growing up. He was a missionary's kid, grew up in South and Central America. And he then, um, as I was growing up, we just had endless conversations about politics, about what it means to serve. He was active in the civil rights movement in California. And I just took so much from his example of what it really means to serve, to believe in something that's bigger than oneself and to live those values every day. When I started out in the army in 1981, I mean, there just was hardly any women leaders in uniform. In fact, I was in the Army for well over 10 years before I met a senior woman in uniform that I wanted to be more like. It was Evelyn Pat Foote, who had become a general officer in the mid-70s and had been one of the pioneers. And it's not that I hadn't had lots of mentors. I had lots of male strong mentors, but it really took a while for women to you know, develop themselves as leaders. You know, in the army, we can't just go and go to a headhunter and bring in a general officer. That is a growth, a training, a development process that takes, you know, 25, 30 years. So I'm so pleased to be able to look back now, remembering how few and far between women leaders were. In fact, I was the only woman in my training program. In the entire psych psychiatry training program. No faculty members were women, no fellow residents or interns. But now, you know, you've, we've had four-star women, general officers everywhere you look, command sergeant majors, they're, you know, we've got women who are going through the, the Sears course, the special operations course, the Rangers training course. And of course, this is no surprise to uh, people like myself who've long known that women are, women are capable of so much more than they've been given the opportunity to do. And I'm just proud to be, you know, a part of that um, ladder of progress. I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in the military's role in 
being able to usher in social advances, social changes. You look what we've done with gender integration, with racial integration, and now, of course, on the LGBTQ front. It's, it's, it's a remarkable um, process and progress to point to. And, you know, I, over the years, I, I, I had the opportunity to, to work closely with Senator Gillibrand, who's been a tireless, tireless advocate for military sexual trauma survivors. And it's been important for me once I got out of the Army, once I retired from the Army in late 2010, I really was able to, for the first time, really understand what it had been like to be a woman in the military. Because, you know, while I was in uniform, that was the last thing that we wanted to do was to, you know, call attention to ourselves for being different. But I've been very, very proud of now in my most recent capacity as the founding commissioner for the New York City Department of Veterans Services to work with both Senator Gillibrand as well as Senator Schumer and also to draw upon the expertise and the um, camaraderie of other members of Congress. And I am a trailblazer as a unifying leader. What I have done over my many, many years of leadership, both in the Army, which is the most diverse institution on earth, as well as more recently here in New York, which is also a very, very diverse crossroads of the world, I have always learned to respect and honor the viewpoints wherever they lie across the spectrum, from the far left to the far right. But when it comes time to move forward, it's important to be transparent and to be able to unify folks, bring them together, listen to voices, and then craft solutions which are pragmatic and which achieve sustainable results. But I'll tell you, our success will depend upon my ability and New Yorkers' ability to come together as we have so many times before and have you know, taken on so many tough, tough challenges. And it's important to remind ourselves of that, particularly at a time like this. I will say that when I saw the politics of fear starting to take root, that's actually, Pierre, a large part of what really generated my impetus, my decision to throw my hat in the ring. I saw what happened when AOC won her surprise election over uh, Joe Crowley in 2018. And I saw career political uh, elected leaders here in New York who started reacting rather than responding, who who, who rejected in you know their practices, their their um, uh, partnerships of the past, and who started demonizing individuals as well as industries. That led us to the Amazon debacle, and that was political malpractice at all levels, in my view. And so I I'm very concerned about bringing New York City together because if we only listen to the far left or to the far right we've lost an opportunity to be everything that we can be, particularly in this critical moment. The current mayor has presented a false choice, in my view, between public health and safety and a constitutional right to protest. I think both are critical and both can be respected and honored and protected. When you look at New York City right now, over a thousand businesses that have been destroyed, not by the pandemic, but by the protests that were allowed to take place with open arms, placing the entire city at risk. So I think that uh, you will see in my brand of leadership, a an emphasis on relationships, a groundedness in values. You know, Pierre, I lead with heart. So honor, empathy, accountability, respect, and teamwork are at the very center and core of not just what I do, but who I am.